Hello, my name is Andrew Martin and I'm from London. I'm a generalizing specialist and quantified self nut. And I'm from Wildy, which is a Node.js engineering firm. It's got a really diverse international team and I work with some super smart people. So if you're ever in London, please come and say hi. So I've done a little bit of everything and a lot of some things like dev, DBA, tester, ops guy, architect, in startups and in enterprises. And the practices of DevOps are the glue between those principles. I want to talk about what makes a project fail. And I've just noticed that these are a slightly outdated version of my slides. So let's just refresh. Excuse me. And how we can mitigate against these failures, <laughs> of which this is potentially one. There we go. So what makes these projects fail? How you can avoid these pitfalls, time-saving tips, and aiming for maximum project velocity. So there is no one-size-fits-all solution. I'll aim to generalize as much as possible. So what is this big, scary problem that causes release paralysis? The inability to ship code. We, the team, the business, we're afraid. We don't trust our tools and processes. We don't like touching anything. When we do pluck up the courage to make a change and try to make something better, it all goes wrong. I feel this pain. We don't deserve to be standing on a wire, performing tricks. It's no way to live. We deserve to work our nine till five, ship quality code, and have our weekends carefree. No stress. Your choice of drink may vary. So, spoiler alert. We'll talk about Docker, about configuration management, about QA teams, about automation, about releasing, and DevOps. Docker has brought enterprise deployment practices and made it available to small teams. Configuration management is an organizational anti-pattern. Uh, sorry, uh, traditional configuration management, the act of mutable servers, is a dying pattern. Everything should be automated perpetually and repeatedly. Release early, release often, and be more DevOps. Hopefully, some of you recognize elements of these from previous stagnated deployments. Removing blockers ensures the shortest path to enlightenment. We want to feed off the generosity of the ecosystem. We can get a lot of open source things for free, so I'll assume as an audience member, you're in stealth mode, or you're running a business with some secret source. Otherwise, you'd be using the open source tier for some of these things. So I'll go through some free tooling for private use. I have no affiliations with any of these companies, except for a lot of alpha, beta, and production testing. The only expense incurred will be compute and bandwidth, and continuous practices for small teams, minimal configuration, enterprise practices, time is money. And I'll assume that you either have management buy-in or a willingness to learn. So release early or die trying. It's not quite as easy as it may sound. But removing friction from every step of the deployment process will speed up the time it takes you to get to production, and reduce the burden of pain that is perceived. Monoliths, microservices, desktop, mobile apps, they can all be tested. Even Electron apps come with a WebDriver framework to inject and test those desktop apps as if they were web applications. Specific instrumentation and extra test code is not really regarded that highly, but sometimes it's necessitated in order to ensure you have coverage. Everything must be testable, but it's a question of how much pain are you willing to tolerate to test something. So 
to release early, we start with continuous integration. Everybody pulling together in the same direction. Phase two, delivery gets the code to a production-ready state. Delivery is your favorite furniture company designing an item, sawing the components up, and delivering you the furniture. Deployment is making it useful, doing the same thing over and over, always going forward, refining the process, but most importantly, deferring to machines, removing the human interaction. Humans are fallible. The machines should be in control, and then UAT is performed by actual users. So the three Cs, continuous integration, running tests on every commit, continuous delivery, if the test suite passes and the software is proven, it's put into a production-like environment, and it's ready as a potential release candidate to be shipped, and continuous deployment. If the release candidate is near production, ship it without human interaction. People are process friction, reduce their inputs. So not all of these techniques are suitable for everybody, for every situation or context. So there's no dogma here. Adherence to some of these principles will reduce this friction, but there may be some cases, for example, air-gapped industries like medicine or finance or health or banking, which probably want a master deployment key in a Faraday cage in a, bunk in a bunker buried deep underground. So different teams have different needs. We want to avoid having code that we want to ship and we can't. Reducing build cycle times, reducing the friction between your laptop and production, and maximizing velocity will make everything better. So, Continuous best practices. CI, committing everything to a single main line, testing everything, automating the rest, relentlessly optimizing and radiating information so everybody is aware the communication pathway is reduced because, again, machines are doing some of this work for you. So continuous integration, the main line, a single trunk of source code development. This is not continuous integration. Merging and rebasing sucks. Branches can languish. Sometimes integrating code takes more technical complexity and effort from the developer or developers who've developed the features than just feature flagging the thing, constantly fixing the bugs as they arrive. Is it better to fix a bug at deployment time or integration time or when you're in the context, when you're writing code, when you're in the zone, the question is for you. Reintegration, good communication, skirt some of these problems, but ultimately, the more branches you have, the more time you'll spend merging them back in. You can add more people to a team, but that has its limit in Brooks' law. Adding manpower to a software project will only make it later. Too many connections, stagnate meetings, and more than one team on the same code base costs exponential communications pathways. So then we've got the GitHub, pull request, branch flow model. It's good for open source, where you don't know who your contributors are. You don't necessarily trust them. You want a review of every line of code. Time is immaterial. These are not the things that your business will care about. It's bad for teams with deliverables. We should be able to trust our colleagues. The agility and speed of the team and delivery is impacted. So instead of a mandatory pull request or review step, why not pair with developers? Why not mob program? Why not increase the communication through asynchronous methods like Slack? Teach instead of reflect. Tutor instead of profess. And upskill everybody relentlessly and equally. Maybe there's some compromise here. A new developer might require code review. They may need bringing up to speed. Or large features may be worked on by multiple developers that make feature toggling more complex than actually pushing onto a separate branch. The risk is that humans are again in the process. Somebody has to deal with your merge conflicts. And a merge conflict is a rewrite of code. You're introducing potential branching and logic changes that have never been tested. So rely on tooling, testing, static analysis, automatic features. These things are fine 
if you've not got a deadline, but who really cares? The people paying the wages and paying the uptime costs for your compute and bandwidth. So, how to be as fast as possible whilst maintaining quality. These are most people's favorite pyramids. People travel from all over the world to see them. But this is my favorite pyramid. To run in this manner, having the whole or partial stack deployable on your local machine, and this is when new shiny tooling really dazzles, facilitated by things like Docker Compose, you can describe the entire system declaratively. You can filter out the parts you don't want, bring up components, attach mocks to the edges, and run distributed systems and everything of lesser complexity on your local machine. This eases full stack debugging and means that your system tests can be run and debugged locally. The build server verifies instead of running tests for the first time. You've got to test, people. It's dependent on the team. The type of testing that's applicable to your software will vary wildly. So it's a balance upon application. I've left two slides in here, just a mixture of sort of personal mantra and accepted dogma, if you like, but never testing implementation, never test the same unit twice, only test the interface of what's under test. Overlapping layers of tests should be trusted to cover the domain that they're testing. Uh, I've, all these things I believe in very strongly. Trust that a passing test covers the case. I won't go through them all, but they're there for posterity. There's so much information available on correct testing practices online. Just go out, and get it, and do it. So a QA team, where do they fit into the testing cycle? Should they be doing this work for you? They should be thinking of destructive ways to break your code. That's the rationale for QA. They're not supposed to be testing the expected behavior of your application. If you don't understand and own the domain that you are programming in, you risk not delivering the correct solution. QA should be used to discuss requirements and review test cases before you write the code. It's a thought process and everyone's brain is equally valuable. So, version control. This is easy, right? It transpires. Everybody does it slightly differently. Google have a huge distributed post-perforce version control system that statically analyzes the code being checked in, builds a dependency graph, and tests in a huge grid all of the necessary touch points across all the features and applications that are under test. They have an editor in their code search tool and an optional but mostly utilized code review step. Facebook have a weekly merge window where developers have credit. And if they fail to ship the solution that they're supposed to be shipping, their credit diminishes to the point where they may end up unable to actually push code to production. GitHub, everything's done via chat ops. It's all automated. But all these guys move more slowly than Amazon. Amazon push a change to their servers every 11.6 seconds, and they classify a change as any code which goes to one or more servers. So when they deploy to the entire infrastructure at the same time, it's still just one push. That is the apogee of continuous deployment. So continuous best practices automate everything else, relentlessly optimize the build chain, and radiate information. Build, measure, learn, and repeat. Do more of what's going well and less of what's going badly. So now that we have our foundational practices sorted, simple continuous deployment. Again, keeping this fast, free, and private. So all developers daily perform the first two activities on this list. It's second nature. But the rest of the list, if it seems like a lot, it is. In order to get to continuous deployment, we need to be cats of all trades, generalizing specialists with a wide range of skills and deep knowledge of specific areas. It may seem daunting, but you can learn anything in 20 hours. That's two hours a weeknight for two weeks. Choose a topic and try it out. As for developers, ops guys, and testers, that means learning 
more DevOps. It's buzzwordy. It's marketing speak, but it simply means support your code in production. This is what DevOps is. If you have the confidence in yourself and in your team, this makes everything faster, better, and more resilient, while reducing your team's bus factor and upskilling everybody, bridging the gaps between teams, bringing developers to perform system tasks, debug deployments, having ops guys go up into the application code that they're supposed to be supporting, which classically for them is black box, and having testers verify system reliability and fault tolerance, moving more into a site reliability role than plain QA. So with that brief call to arms, what development environment is best for continuous deployment? I've alluded it to it already. The barrier to enterprise deployment styles are pre-packaged immutable application units, aka namespaces and C groups, aka containers, also known as Docker. This is what Google ships two billion times a week to different servers, and we have them to thank eight years ago for beginning the process of Linux kernel C group integration, so we now have namespaces for PIDs and CPUs and memory, all the works. So, Agility and repeatability. Do we start running and developing our code inside or outside of Docker? If we're deploying to a Linux host and we're on a Mac, then inside Docker means that we're actually developing in our target environment. We've mounted a volume in, and we're able to run the same application code as will hit production on our local machines. This brings some of the pain of integration forward, another classic tenet of CI. However, if you're on a Mac, there are some file system watch issues. The Docker for Mac is attempting to fix some of these. It's a little unwieldy. It can take a little longer than running things locally, but it's not that long until these things converge. There are some essential differences, however. Environment variables and centralized configuration will differ in your development environment versus what you have on production. Docker only runs a single version of a kernel on the machine, and that's your host kernel, or the VM's kernel that's running the Docker machine binary. This means that you may be uh, exposed to some kernel differences if you're targeting, say, an older sort of pre-4 kernel branch. Networking may be different. You have to deploy different fabrics to different environments. There are some restrictions between, say, Google Container Engine, AWS, whatever you run in bare metal. There's a lot of permutations. It's just a consideration. And never underestimate hardware for exposing race conditions. This is one of the best and worst things about running a full system on your local machine is that you're likely to churn, you're likely to run slower. So churn up errors and bugs that would not ever be exposed on production unless it was under super high load, at which point it probably would have auto-scaled out. However, that one time it doesn't auto-scale, you've brought the pain forward by fixing it on your local machine. Other container runtimes are available. Rocket from CoreOS is really nice. It has a very different philosophy and aims more to be for the developer rather than for sort of the general consumer, but it does have less tooling around it at this point in time. It is being integrated with various open source projects in the way Docker was, and it will catch up soon. Docker Compose is the magic piece here. It gives you the ability to spin up local production-like environments, which will aid disaster recovery, bug reproduction, and your development speed. So the dev environment must be re-repeatable, deterministic, running production-like test data, you've probably got sensitive client information in your production databases. And that's often used as an excuse not to allow developers access to those databases. It's no effort or a reasonable amount of effort to automate a nightly scrub job, create a text fi fixture, add it to a Docker data volume, mount that volume in your tests, and now your CI, your staging environment, and your developers are running with production-like data reducing friction, reducing the amount of time it takes to find the bug because you know that it's not down to the test data, or it reduces that significantly. So source control. There are various different options again. 
GitHub. It's not free. They have unlimited private repos. And despite a beautiful UI and social features, it doesn't fit our criteria of free. So Bitbucket, it's coming up to speed with the other players, but it's really still trailing, which leaves just one, GitLab. I'm sure a lot of you have used it because they've really come to prominence in the last couple of years. The UI takes some getting used to, but there is a free Dockerized official release that deploys with almost zero effort. It runs your source control, Docker registry, and CI, and all you have to maintain are your backups. It will act as a build server in a container. There's a free version hosted that runs on DigitalOcean droplets. And self-hosted means that all this is free minus compute. The droplets can have a little bit of CPU contention and be a little slow. So you can run for very little cost. The CI runner uses the now familiar Travis CI style YAML DSL and is near feature parity with other providers like Travis and CodeShip. It lags behind Jenkins only for huge, very complex pipelines, which if you've had to deal with them, you probably wish that you never had to in the first place. Provisioning servers. How do we bring things up from nothing? Terraform is the best of the worst to do this. There is still difficulty in maintaining determinism with these builds. There's an addition called Terra Grunt, which uses DynamoDB to lock your deploys, so two guys can't deploy the same thing at the same time, which ends up in all sorts of hell. So this might cost money to run the servers, but we have to spend something somewhere, right? Scaleway is a super cheap French-based hosting service, as is OVH. You don't really have to expend much to run a distributed system on these sort of three nodes for like about 80 euros, if I remember correctly. So the deployment itself frees your dependencies on the build server. If you're using NPM, you shrink wrap, lock them down, because you don't want to be the victim of a semantic release version mistake somewhere through what you consider a blessed version upgrade. So these artifacts that you build from the build server are essentially ephemeral. They're just there as the product of the deterministic scripts that have built them. Disaster recovery can just be run all builds. It's somewhat of a gamble, but if you trust the process, it shouldn't be. If you're making money, you should at least be backing up those images for quicker recovery. So deployment targets, you can just push to a Docker platform. You can use plain old Docker, but you run the risk of writing your own scheduler and orchestrator, which is insane. Do not do that. So the three we have here, Swarm lags behind the other two. And Kubernetes and Mesos are the kind of market leaders at this stage. Swarm also comes into some criticism because of the way that the enterprise Docker group company treat the competition. Um, there's some concern that the VCs behind them are maybe manipulating what they do. Um, Mesos was the first of the orchestration platforms to arrive for containers, born out of Twitter. But its complexity is such that you may need an additional ops team to support its running. So the clear winner here, I believe, will be Kubernetes. The committer rostrum is huge. It's a, the speed of the project growing and the uptake by enterprise and in general has been massive and importantly it's backed by Google based on the lessons learned from deploying containers for the last eight years so it will most likely win this war although if you want to get really crazy you can run it on top of Mesos but if that's too complex then you can run a platform as a service on top of Kubernetes if you want to spend money you can run Kubernetes on Google container engine which confusingly is spelt GKE to disambiguate from the compute engine, and then run one of these guys on top. Deus has a repository manager for images that's now being integrated with Kubernetes. So the two of them are very tight. They cross commit to each other's repositories, and the UI allows huge control. This just reduces your ops burden and gives access to developers to your production environments. Logging. You want to be able to post-mortem an intrusion or a failure. You've got to ensure that your application has a tracer header that propagates between microservice calls or even down into your logs so you can see 
the roots of a request through the system. Docker has a number of logging drivers. You can ship your logs remotely, or you can use Logstash. And here's the free recommendation. These guys act as a Elasticsearch, Logstash, and Kibana host that give you a gigabyte of data per day, three-day retention, and no ops burden. You can use all sorts of different tools for monitoring. Again, these are three guys with a free tier. Plenty of things will perform a remote HTTP check to ensure your service is still up. Or you could do something a bit more funky, like use Zapier's email to SMS bridge, so you actually get SMS alerts on your phone, or go into Slack. Or you could use Stackstorm, which is an event-driven automation framework. So it's the same idea as Zapier, except it's dedicated for ops tools. And uh, I quote, used for auto-remediation of security and other events, as well as chat ops. So this is backed by some of the guys in London who were uh, involved running the Docker meetup. They did a demo of it the other day, and it was hugely impressive. There is a burden self-hosting, but I'd recommend that you have a look at it. BIP.io was the previous incarnation of that type of tool, but sadly, their website was down for a good chunk of this year. It's an open source project, but it seems the momentum has faltered somewhat, so I urge you some caution. OK. So that's the minimum required to achieve continuous deployment. You've got the observability of the system. You've got the traceability of requests. Most of it's free, but what next? You want to scale your system out. You need a load balancer. There's potential downtime. A Cloudflare retry is better than a blank page, but what about visibility? How do we know when it's down? We could do better. So the complex pipelines, again, free and private. Deployment types. So there are three broad types of deployment in enterprise, if you like. Blue-green, the canary deploys, or Brian Lara's Hidden Hope. One of these costs twice as much as the production stack. One of them has application complexity, and one of them is human-driven. Canary is my preference and the one that I've seen deployed to the greatest effect. You pay an application complexity trade-off when running this style of deployment. Post-deployment testing is important because your code is going from the developer's machine through the automated tests, which test all previous known bugs and the features that have been defined. But a new interaction between code paths may lead to a bug in production. Testing's even automated testing not infallible. So you have to test really carefully and stringently. So to Canary release, you put a new version of a service into production. You may have five running already. You add the sixth. You route test traffic through your application just to that single microservice version via a header, via cookies, whatever, the same process that you've propagated in your previous tracing style. You then continue to roll the service out gradually as you're putting test traffic to it. You monitor application and system metrics, HTTP response codes, latency times, log entries. And as long as all of those are within acceptable tolerances, you continue to scale the thing out until it's overtaken the previous release, it's taking production traffic, and you relieve the previous version of its duties. You can then smoke test your application. Again, this is, uh, it's imperative to smoke test because at that point, you were just routing traffic. Now you want to be sure that what you consider the correct application state responds as you'd hope. Some tooling has emerged to do this for you. A few years ago, this would be something you had to write yourself at great cost, and it wouldn't really have been worth it because there's too much complexity, and unless you're a large enterprise, you don't want to take the burden and the risk that you introduce a strange edge case bug. Linkerd is built on top of Finnegal, which is a production-tested, battle-hardened RPC framework from Twitter, and it's used by Twitter, Pinterest, Tumblr, PagerDuty. It allows you to route traffic to your services in exactly the way that I've described. It supports Canary releases by default, and it sits in the middle of your infrastructure as the routing point through which all other traffic passes. That in itself may sound scary. You can scale the thing out to reduce it as a single point of failure. And this takes 
a huge amount of load off the application developers to do things like um, increasing the fault tolerance for your system by circuit breaking, by routing around bad services, by surfacing these system metrics just for free. There is another tool called Envoy, recently open sourced by Lyft. It's new to the market, but it promises an incredible amount of functionality. So performing the same functionality as Linkerd, but also layer four and seven routing, TLS termination, gRPC compatibility, service discovery, health checking, a multitude of statistics to aid in system visibility and debugging, distributed tracing. These are all things that previously would have had to be in libraries included in every application in your microservices galaxy, possibly in different languages, possibly re-implementations of the same functionality multiple times. I urge you to appraise these for your own use cases and reduce the amount of code that you have to write yourself. So, proper testing. Everything looks good. We've started to move traffic over. Our database migrations are done on a column and row basis rather than something destructive in case post-deployment our smoke tests fail and we have to wind back that release. We don't want to be in a situation where we've overwritten or removed data. So, does automation solve everything? Well, testers are non-deterministic. Developers need to own their own domain. Works on my machine is kind of obviated, but Docker means that these differences in kernel, network, environment, possibly data, are flattened pretty low. I wonder where that's gone. There it is. <laughs> so uh, what to do when it all goes wrong? We're living post-rollback. So if there is a failure, it should be triggered as an automatic rollback rather than us having to go back and manually press the button. Although, there's no point being dogmatic. If you're running on a short fuse, you've got production, or you've got a real-time service application, you might have to roll back. Avoiding it at all costs. We don't fail, we continuously improve. The baseline just perhaps slipped. So we embrace failure. We begin by writing a failing test case, stopping the pipeline, did the alerting fire, do our log messages say the correct things? Have our monitoring thresholds been exceeded? If not, why not? We're continuously improving. So during a full emergency or a huge catastrophe, don't try and fix it with a commit. Just roll back to the last known good state. You still have the immutable versions of all the software and the configuration that you deployed to give your application that state. If it still fails, maybe it's data that you're depending on. But by moving in empirical, observable steps, you can rule out whole classes of bugs very quickly. You still want to write tests to validate that the new bug doesn't affect that version. Reproduce the production error locally and pray that it's not a Heisen bug. So Heisen bugs are ephemeral, seemingly non-reproducible bugs based on Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. Docker should reduce this possibility because we're running immutably. We still have the considerations of previously. The kernel differs. The networking may be wired differently. The container startup parameters may change. The Docker engine may be running differently. But this is the first port of call if it's running locally. It could be a race condition. Attach a debugger or try one of the new breed of asynchronous system observability tools. If you've not seen these before, they are truly fabulous. Sysdig intercepts system calls via a kernel module. It's incredibly powerful and easy to use. It's asynchronous, so gives you the same broad direction of functionality as S-Trace would, but without impacting the system, because, of course, S-Trace blocks. So if you're trying to reproduce a race condition, you'll probably never find it. It has a hosted monitoring product available, too, which is able to automatically introspect network traffic to, for example, tell you which SQL queries are going slowly, because it sees them on the wire. It's a mind-blowing tool, which I encourage you, again, to explore. Dtrace was originally a Sun tool. It's now available on Linux, but is slightly limited in what it can do. And the Berkeley packet, or Berkeley packet filter provides a raw interface to data link layers. So if you've got a communications problem, you can, again, write an asynchronous packet capturing 
tool uh, script to try and identify that. So catastrophe survival, create a failing test case, commit it. You're running a clone of production in your CI environments for this very reason. Fix it, re-enable the pipeline, and we're back to continuous deployment. Of course, not all these techniques are suitable for every situation. But adoption of some of them will make your lives easier. So in conclusion, Docker has brought large-scale deployment possibilities to small teams. There's no barrier to adopting these. Kubernetes is informed by the inner workings of Google, eight years of experience. Let them handle the complexity for you. Use it directly or run a platform as a service on top. Traditional, traditional configuration management is dying. Application configuration belongs inside a container. It's more important to have containers and servers that provision correctly and that can be used locally. And Terraform is the best option to help you across the clouds. QA teams are an organizational anti-pattern. Instead, slim them down and repurpose their expertise into test case analysis. Don't allow fear to slow you down. Long regression testing cycles can and will delay releases indefinitely. Automate everything as code, tests, pipelines, deployments, alerting, and be more DevOps. Be a generalist. Knowledge is power. Upscale your teams. Measure, learn, improve constantly. Show you care, show you trust yourself, show you trust your team. Support your software in production, I urge you. So all these things enable you to release early, release often, ship features, fix bugs, and go home on time. I welcome any feedback at the joined-in link below. I'll publish these slides shortly, and thank you for listening.